Mm. For Asante Achim North, Andy Apia Kobe, he's sitting just right here as well. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. And, of course, we also do have the man who has been joining the fight, Aula, and the rest against this ally that we've been talking about since the discussion on this very subject at Darabos. So Deputy Director Arocha Ghana, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Last but not the least here, Professor Michael Say, Achinabona, Acting Director General, Council for Scientific Research at CSIR. Thank you so much, sir. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. So we're going to delve. Shall we give all our panel members a round of applause again? I think we've had, we've had quite a productive uh, discussion so far with a man who joined the military operation really giving us what we need to ask for. It's not like we are not clear in our minds exactly what we need and what we're seeing on the ground. And earlier when Alfred was introducing uh, our distinguished uh, uh, persons in our midst, he talked about Andy Apiakubi and the fact that his neighbor's uh, constituency, as it were, has some serious illegal mining going on. For your information, those involved in that constituency say that illegal mining is not illegal. And so we'll find out from him, I'll start with him exactly what he has done, what he's doing, what is the magic to ensure that there's no uh, such activity in his constituency. So Andy, let me start with you. What's the magic wand? What's working for you? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I think, uh, we have all seen videos of places where illegal mining are currently even ongoing. Uh, so it is not for me to say it is here or there, but at least I can talk about my own jurisdiction and confidently tell you that there is no single unit of land in my constituency where you will find illegal mining. Uh, but to start with, uh, I heard from previous speakers uh, that uh, we have had efforts to even uh, annul some of the legislation, except that I will humbly suggest that we must identify the course of action properly and the forum for the action to take. And indeed, the Constitution tells us that it is only in the Supreme Court that uh, we can attack an existing legislation. So the, I, I spoke to the director and he said that we are in high court, we are in the wrong place. So let's go to the appropriate forum and then prefer our challenges to whatever is the legislation. Beyond that, I think we can use a parliamentary process also where a motion could be filed for us to attack the, uh, the authenticity or veracity of the legislation. That could be a long process. And that could also bring us back into the fold of the executive. And Article 178, again, invokes the power of the president to appoint committees and uh, commissions that come uh, to us and touch enough and learn a case study. And the case study in the Santa Chilov has not been the effort of one person. Indeed, uh, wherever you find Galamse ongoing, three, four groups of people, if one of them is complicit, it will happen. If all of them are not complicit, it will not happen. You mentioned the member of parliament, you mentioned the uh, MCE, DCE, whoever, you mentioned the chiefs, and then you mentioned opinion leaders. If all of us come together to fight it, it will not happen. And that's how we've done it in Asante Achimnov. And on this note, I, I will mention uh, some chiefs in my area. Uh, Nana Kwekusapong, who is a man of Agogo traditional area. He himself personally, when some people attempted to start somewhere, he himself called me and said, and he let it not happen, and it did not happen to them. Uh, there is power within the constitution to allow a civil society to even arrest when somebody is in the process of causing, uh, you know, causing havoc to community, society, and indeed uh, breaching our laws. Uh, Nana called me, we went there, we arrested, we prosecuted, we uh, punished them, and then we seized their equipment and all that, it didn't happen. Uh, Nana Bafo Usubidiakum, 
Omaihene of Domia Bra. He called me that the people were coming to the street. The same night that they came, the same night they left. And we arrested them. Indeed, we punished them. Civil punishment. I'm not recommending that. But when we are so provoked in the society where we say we don't want it, we need to send the warning to you so that the others also learn that they won't come. And I have ever told uh, uh, Minerals Commission that you can give the certificates in Accra, but we need to show them where to mine. But definitely not in our area. Because we are united in this purpose. Myself, my MCE, my chiefs, and I've mentioned their names, calling us to go and make sure they, we drive them away. There is a, a site in um, Pechereche where some miners put up a building. We drove them out of that building. We are giving to our teachers to live in. They will not come back because we will not allow them. And I'm saying this because if all of us say that we will not allow, the power of the community is stronger than the power of any one individual. So, Mr. Akubi, what I hear you say is that all the areas where we have illegal mining going on, I am telling you that, the MPs are indirectly... I'm telling you that one of the people I mentioned will be complicit before it will happen. One, at least one of them will be complicit. If all of them say we will not allow, and we have not allowed them, indeed there were occasions where we had to seize their, goods, their equipments, send them to the police. In fact, I had crossed jurisdiction to go and attack uh, illegal miners because the river on which they were mining is the same river that served all of us in the enclave. And therefore, we will not say because it's out of my jurisdiction. I will not go and attempt, except that on that occasion where they ran away and left the gold. I could not see it because I don't know what gold is, because it's the calamity that befell me on the day. But at least the warning went to them that we will not allow them to destroy our bodies. So my prescription is that let's all do it. I heard one of them say that leadership of the country is helpless. Community society is helpless. Everybody is helpless. Not only uh, leadership of society. It is all of us. And indeed, uh, when people were appointed and were given uh, shadows to go and manage, they should have told them right there that this is what we want to do and we will do it to the latter. In fact, when I had an invitation to come here, I advertised that on our MP's platform. So many of them were discouraging me to come because they think that Mr. So-so-and-so -so -so is MPDC, so so, -so, -so. I go beyond politics. So, Mr. Piagubi, I, I would want uh, the other panel members to also give their preliminary thoughts on what has been said so far and why we have allowed ourselves to get, uh, I mean, to have our water bodies and our environment polluted. But very briefly, and if you could answer yeah, it in like... Briefly, <laughs> I think this thing should be devoid of politics. I go beyond politics. And whoever has not performed, has not performed in the capacity he has been given opportunity to serve, not as a politician. And somebody said that politicians are... Look, we could have qualified that with some. I am not that type of politician who will succumb to intimidation and uh, influence. No. If it's not true, it is not true. If it's wrong, it is wrong. And let us behave like that as citizens of the country. Thank you. I know you called the AG out when he said that those... names that were named in uh, Professor Frimpong Boateng's uh, report, uh, there, there was no evidence to prosecute them. I know you called him out on that. So uh, what's, what's passed? We, we what, 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 2022? What did you do? I know yes, you're one out of 270. Let's go to the process quickly. Uh, when uh, an ally is filed in Parliament, uh, it is the work of the state institution that brings the ally. We have no power to affect the content, uh, except that we can vote uh, by two-thirds majority to reject the whole, uh, the whole legislation. Did you? Uh, no, we did not, because... Uh, 2022, indeed, when the ally was filed, some of us disagreed. But you need 22 thirds of that parliamentary majority to be able to reject it. We call for uh, pre-laying conferencing. 
and uh, pre-laying conferencing is where we even uh, consider the legislation uh, paragraph by paragraph. And the pre-laying conferencing did not happen. And uh, the law says that if it is laid for uh, 21 days without any objections, uh, it comes into law. Uh, the fact is also that uh, you as a person cannot affect it if you don't have your numbers. You will waste your time if you raise it even in a memo and it is not supported by two tests. It is difficult. It is only the leadership of parliament that can whip the two tests for you to be successful. But again, uh, the leadership of parliament is also being influenced by executive. And that is where the law must pick the clarity that parliament must also have independence. And when the president will appoint leaders of parliament and the leaders of parliament will take instructions from executive and come and whip all of you to support it. Parliament is unable to do its work. I mean, obviously, you're trying to say that the separation of powers that we have in our constitution hasn't worked. Hasn't worked. And, and therefore, vote. it is affecting checks and balances. If we, because because we are in parliament, we cannot vote for our leaders. And somebody outside parliament will have to select leaders for us. That is the failure in the law and the constitution. And we must address that. I saw you, Darubosu, uh, smiling when uh, Honorable Apiakubi was talking and the seeming inability on his part to prevent this law uh, no, airline, one, legislative one instrument cannot. from coming into effect. Now, it took a group like Arocha Ghana and our last group to want to go to the court to repeal this. And but again, go to the proper court. <laughs> okay, so they would, they would answer that. So I want to yes, really get your preliminary okay, thoughts yeah, on what he's just submitted and indeed why, from where you sit, beyond all that we've heard, we've allowed ourselves to allow illegal mining to damage our environment, water bodies. And we are even talking about our very lives because people are suffering from kidney diseases and the rest. You see, you see that? Article 2 says 8 of the Constitution. It gives power to Parliament to ratify all contracts. But 2682 says that, except that we can give the power to somebody else. So, Mr. And that's where the problem Mr. starts. Mr. Pia Kubi, I'll come back to you. I just want uh, yes. Darabosu to give us his thought. Yes, so thank you very much. Um, I just want to say that, I mean, there's been everything wrong with an ally um, which allows for mining and forest reserves. And um, we have said that uh, um, there will, some consultation will have been very crucial. I mean, I know that there's some, some antecedent to this. I mean, we've had, Ghana has had guidelines for a long time, as far back as 1990. We said to regulate or I would say guide the operation of mining in what they call production reserves. So our legal frameworks and even our policy frameworks clearly abhors mining in forest reserves. But some time back, they realized that that notwithstanding, some activities of mining was going on in some forest reserves. So they said, okay, let's come out with some guidelines. But these guidelines are only going to permit some level of mining, not more than 2%, of all forest reserves together in production forest, forest reserves. I say production because Ghana has got two categories of forest. Those that are considered protected entirely and those that are production. So we were, we've been working with this for as long as for over 20 years now. And then we realized discussion started with um, civil society and government. And the whole idea was that look, despite the fact that there are guidelines, there are some operations of mining damaging our forest reserve. So how do we strengthen those guidelines and even prevent more mining from happening? At the same time, we have been pushing for new guidelines and actually policy framework that was saying that by 2030, Ghana would have completely excluded mining activities from all our forest reserves. So to our shock, CSO's shock, we come, we come somewhere in 2023, and then we hear that the government has passed a law, LI 2462, allowing for the government and the executive to decide that, look, if it's a protected forest and they see certain minerals there, they will be given the opportunity to mine. Now, this is quite contrary to every protection or every policy framework of excluding mining for, from our forest reserves. So for us, even the process that led to that LI being passed was problematic. And that's why we say that 
It was clandestine. It was meant to actually evade the watchful eyes of civil society so they could have them. And the way we say it, all intent and purpose was to have access to our forest reserves to mine them without considering the risks associated with it. And like you said, I mean, the issue as to what happened in parliament. I'm, I'm very happy that the Honorable has been very open about the processes and what's really transpired. It's been very difficult to get information. And clearly, we even think that even in parliament, the process for which the document came out for discussion did not follow as it is. And like you said, it was supposed to have been a, a conference, all of that didn't happen. I mean, a lot of things, we tried to do some follow-up. We, we saw that some stages were skipped. So it tells you that there was some intention, deliberate intention, to get access to our forest reserves. And now we see it. As we speak, there are about 24 forest reserves, which are now under the application, under application for mining, and 12 of them are targeted, and they are all protected forest reserves. And for the 12 of them, mining applications or leases have been granted. Mm. All that we are waiting is for these companies to move in and start destroying the forest, which is very unfortunate. Let me, yeah. if you're done with your thoughts, let me come to you, Awula. And he just talked about the clandestine nature under which this uh, LI was passed. And one of the things that struck me when I was looking at it was even the name, Environment Protection <laughs> and Regulations 2022 LI2462. Let me just get your thought on it briefly and also on why you think we've allowed ourselves to come here beyond what they've said. Thank you very much. Before I start with your permission, I want to say that we think it's a travesty that demonstrators, unarmed demonstrators who were protesting against this canker against our being poisoned, we are all being poisoned to death, against the existential threat we face. They, are rather, they have rather been incarcerated, and those who are destroying Ghana with impunity are walking free. Destruction is taking place in broad daylight, and they are walking free. So I think this is a travesty. And as a lawyer, I do feel that it's bringing our justice system into disrepute, because people are asking me, why were they refused bail? Were they plotting a coup? Were they murderers? Were they rapists? Why should they be denied bail? So I thought I had to say this before I began. But uh, to add to what my brother Daryl said. Uh, and I'm sorry, let me just uh, stay a bit longer on that. They've been incarcerated for two weeks, and I'm sure you're well, aware of that. Well, they've been remanded in custody for two weeks. For two weeks. And I'm told, because I have, was not there, so I'm relying on what I've been told, that the others were not even brought to court. And we all know what our rights are. Regardless of what has taken place, they were trying to raise awareness about something that is affecting each and every one of us. And let me say this, the water you have here, it's being treated, but it's not being treated to remove mercury. So we could be drinking mercury, like has been said before. I mean, I find it very difficult to get it around my head that we could master the number of police officers we got there. And yet when people are in broad daylight on the water bodies, we can't do anything. So I think that this is wrong, and all of us should add our voices to say, release these persons, release them. Do you intend to do anything about it just before you go to your... Well, we've or... added our voices that they should be released. I didn't join the demonstration because we had had a press conference organized by Media Against uh, Galamse and others. And uh, my understanding was that we're giving the government up to the 30th of uh, September to meet our demands, which I'll repeat here, failing which would advise ourselves. So I was saying that, well, if I'm being part of a meeting that has given a deadline, then we'll wait for the deadline. But we're not waiting quietly. Whilst we are waiting, we're still drawing awareness to the canker that's going on. I don't have to list it. The GMA has spoken. We know the rise in, in kidney disease, neurological challenges. We know about the stillbirths, deformed babies. I mean, we know about the loss of livelihood for farmers and uh, fishermen. We know about what is happening. So I don't think we need to spend time mm. on the situation. What we need to do is focus on the solutions. How do we get out of this mess? And as I've been saying, if the firefighters are the arsonists, then you have a real, real problem. And I like what our MP said, because he's spoken truth. It is true. I remember the case of Atronsu um, in the Western North region. They have resisted community mining, and we have a case in court. A, a few weeks ago, we heard that excavators were finding their way to Atronsu. And I personally contacted the regional minister and informed him about what was going on. To cut a long story short, the excavators found their way there, destroyed cocoa farms, and some of our activists are cocoa farmers, and polluted the once pristine Atronso stream. The, it was so pristine. I mean, the water was like this. It used to boast that it's better than 
um, <laughs> it's better than faulty. And despite what we did, they were, they were continuing with their legal mining. It took the intervention of, we managed to contact the former commander, and uh, to cut a long story short, we commend the former commander and the current one, and they put an end to it. They haven't been prosecuted yet. I'm told that they've, uh, they were arrested and they've been, they are out on bail. So they are out on bail, but the protesters are in custody. What kind of justice system do we mm. have? So I want to say that I agree with what you said, that if there's a wall and there's a gap in the wall, that is when the illegal miners will come in. Had those who had the authority to stop the Atronsu stream from being poisoned did their work, it wouldn't have happened. And I want to point to the example of Gemma. We have uh, Father JB and others who are doing a fantastic job. And Gemma has no illegal mining, although the neighboring um, uh, communities might have, because people have stood firm. In their case, the chief is even ill. He's had a stroke. They've tried to bribe him, but he has resisted, put his community first, and has said, no mining, whether commit small scale, whatever. No mining to destroy my environment. So, and then just to add to what you said, I think that LI2462 is a perverse piece of legislation because you cover it under protection of forest reserves. So everybody thinks you are coming to protect when you know, when you know that you are coming to destroy. And it's not just forest reserves, it includes globally significant biodiversity areas. We've talked about biodiversity. So who in his right mind, who has the interest of Ghanaians at heart, will think of passing LI2462? It's perverse. And thank God a group of organizations have come together to challenge it. And we'll go into that as well as the main discussion. But since we have the arrest of the protesters on the floor, I just want to get your brief comment on what is happening now. I'm coming to you, uh, General Nunu Mensa. I mean, we just heard I would like uh, saying that this is a travesty of justice, really. Why are we arresting people who have not gone to burn things or destroy things? I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on this. Use your microphone, sir. Use your microphone. Oh, I want to go back a little bit. First of all, talk lightly about myself. I've been introduced as National Security Advisor. That doesn't impress me very much. But I was once Chief of Defense Staff. Mm. 40, what, five years ago. And I prefer that definition more than national security advisor. I'm proud of it. And frankly speaking, at the age of almost 88 today, almost, this wouldn't have happened a couple of years ago. Ghana is gone. I mean, Ghana, as I knew, couldn't have seen this happening when we became independent. We were patriots. We love our country. Jonah, please, your mic. We still can't hear you. No, so <laughs> just get it a bit closer to a bit close to my... okay, Excellent, okay. thank you. I'm used to shouting without my mic. That's not why. <laughs> you know, and this couldn't happen in my time. I get very sad. See Ghana like this. Very sad, because in 1957, when we became independent, the only one, as in case three, four, was, a, was, a, was a lawyer, was a graduate. Many of the others were ordinary people, Kufra, 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 ordinary. But they didn't behave like this. We love Ghana. I can't imagine this happening to Ghana now. I, I can't imagine it. That I would do things to hurt Ghana. The leaders who love Ghana, and they taught us to love our country, and it belongs to us. We, we, we vote and elect a president who appoint ministers, hoping that they will do things in our interest. But if, when I see this is happening, I wonder, where am I? Am I in Ghana? So what you're saying that is that the leaders we have don't love Ghana. That's why they're allowing this to pass. Something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong. Leaders in my time made mistakes, but they were genuine mistakes. We're going to give a mining license. I saw on TV about three days ago, must have been this station or whatever, and the water people were drinking made me sick. And we do this to your own people, when you love money? What the hell is going on? I was born in Winneba. My father was a fisherman. My mother sold in the market. I became chief of defense staff. All the fish that I knew when I was growing up, I was a fisherman's son. I was fishing before I left fishing and went to school. 
they have gone extinct. They have been polluted, they have killed them. Those of who are eating that fish, or those fishes, are also dying. I know we are dying. And we see nothing wrong with that. When you go to parliament and make a law, that will protect us. It makes, I mean, I, I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm in Ghana. I, mean, I can't even believe it, that Ghana has become like this. In 1996, I joined the MPP. I didn't like politics, never, and I still don't. But I, became an, I was trying to become an MP to, to like a soldier would, 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 would say, to put sense into parliament. But I couldn't believe that, even if I was an MPP, MPP parliamentarian, and something was wrong, I would never vote for it. I would do so with the military. And, but a good soldier can also not be a good politician. It's, never, it's not going to be possible. I can never tell lies to hurt my country. In 1979, Rollins many of us maybe here were not born, or if you were born, you were very small. Slaughtered in Akufu, Akufu, and others. I was chief of staff. You see? So all these things depend on our integrity, our love of our country. Because the laws that we are talking about, you, make, you give a license for somebody to mine a water body and destroy it. And then we drink the water. We are dying. I know. I'm eight, almost 88. I won't be here for too long. Most of my colleagues have been killed by the stupidity of our, our, some of our leaders. So, I, you know, when, when I'm here, and I hear these things happening, then I wonder, the integrity is gone. Speaking the truth, having the courage to speak the truth is gone. I don't know, my, my, my sadness goes to the fact that my children are in their 50s, my grandchildren are in their, in their, in their 30s. And it's for them that I weep. Because if you run Ghana like this, Ghana will be, Ghana will be no more. We are killing Ghana. So, Jen, I want to move on to the, the two other guests we have, but I, I, I still haven't received an answer from what you think about the arrest of these individuals. I will have said it's travesty of justice, and others yes, even yes, think I, that we are politicizing yes, our justice system. It's, it's sad that we have gone that way. I will never do that. Even I don't believe in using the military in harassing the galaxy. And the reason is very simple. I see the problem as a socioeconomic problem. People are hungry. Why didn't I in Winneba go to you know, do this when I was growing up in Winneba? You know, there was, there, was, there, was, there, was, there was a chance for me to become somebody that I did over the last couple of years. So when people are demonstrating, people are doing what they are doing, it means it's a failure of, of policy. We have not managed them properly. We have not managed them properly. General, I'll come back to you, but let me get the thought of uh, Professor Michael Se Achene Bona. Director, C Director, Acting Director General, CSIR, please, your microphone is just here. Uh, briefly about the arrest and also what you think about what has been said so far. So let me talk about what has been said so far. I think a lot has been said about uh, the arrest, so probably I won't go that way. I think one of the things that came out clearly is about the willpower of the people. You have the political will, and you have the power of the will of the people. And I think that sometimes when the political will fails, the will of the people comes strongly into force. Um, I remember we, we do a lot of research, so we go around places regarding this Galamse. And I remember we went to Oti region, just as uh, Honorable has been saying, and this chief who said that in my community, there is not going to be any galamse, any mining. And he had the support of his people. And it was so great that uh, I remember when we went to do some work, we went to the riverside. And then one of them, I gave him water. One of them, after that, he took the bottle and fetched water from the river and he drank. And he said that our river is completely free of galamse. Uh, when I said uh, they drank, you are actually surprised. In those days, you can ask General, you can ask him. Those days, when you live in the village, you go to the river, you fetch the water, and you drink the water completely free of uh, 
any such heavy metals. And I must say that to some extent, maybe we have an idea, but we do not have much idea of what we are going to face in the near future regarding this galamsey. In fact, I must say that some of them we think because we are in Accra. In fact, if you have roughly about five river systems in this country, and all the river systems are almost gone. One of the, big, the biggest we have that seem untouched is the Volta Basin. And even in the Volta Basin, they've started mining in the black Volta and in the white Volta. And if you don't take care and protect what we have, we will be in a very serious problem. And that is why I'm saying that the will of the people in this case is very, very important. I know some places where the will of the people will be overwhelmed. However, this may be just spots, few spots. If you have places where we are determined, that's why I think that as Ghanaians, we must make sure we do what is necessary. Otherwise, the generation to come may cast us for not taking the right action we should have, been, we should have taken. Sometimes we think that if Pra is destroyed, it is River Pra and not us. We must know that there are other factories and businesses around these rivers. They need the water. And if the river is destroyed, where would they get their water? They will find a way of getting the water. Either they will use it just like that, or they will find a way of taking the, 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 the turbidity out of the water. But the other heavy metals in the water still remain the same. Now, these produce and things that I said will come to Accra, will go to any other place. And if we don't take care, we will be sitting here eating, but some of the items will be bioaccumulated with a lot of heavy metals. And if we do not take care, is going to be very disastrous for us. And I think that is why we need as a people to ensure that all that we got to do, we need to do. We look at the health implication, which is just so serious. I mean, you have various uh, premature children, and especially where they use the gold. Sometimes they said that, because the gold actually, sometimes you check the water body and you can't find them. You find them down within the river. In fact, uh, CSR Water Research, where I'm the director, we've been doing a lot of research in all, all the river bodies. As I'm talking about some of the people who are in the field collecting water samples to let us see the agency and how difficult the situation is. And in fact, uh, including mercury that you find in the water, lead and other stuff like that are found. And this affects our children. In fact, our mothers, uh, the pregnant women, when they take this in, because not for uh, mercury and other, especially mercury, it just evaporates. So when the people are dealing with the gold, it just go into, they inhale it. And the impact is against the uh, person within the uterus because to go through the placenta and all this, so we really, need to make sure that whatever it takes. And that is why I think that you in the media, you are doing well, but I think we all need to go beyond what we are doing Prof, and make sure that. I'm glad you're with CSIR. I mean, we'll move on to uh, how the other uh, uh, mechanisms the government brought failed and indeed what is happening now. Now the government is talking about five-member committee ad hoc committee and we'll look into that and the solutions moving forward. But I just want you to draw just a little bit more on this research you have done. How many rivers or water bodies have you sampled? What is the situation as we have now? And also about really uh, the diseases. And I, I know you've spoken about it. Just give us a clear picture of what you found and oh, how bad it okay. is. Okay, so we have about five river systems. The one, the Southwestern River, you look at Pra, you look at uh, Ancobra, you look at uh, Ophain, River Ophain, you look at all those kind of rivers. All of the rivers are gone in terms of contamination. And especially one thing that is very critical is the turbidity of the water. In fact, for turbidity of the water, we have the UNESCO NTU. Now, this water we have has less than five. 
Okay. Now, for water company to be able to treat the water, they need about a maximum of 2,000 NTU. Now, when we go through most of the rivers, in fact, there are some rivers that are as high as 30,000 NTU. And when you have such system, what happens is that you just can't treat the water. Because if you dare, the money that you need to put in in order to treat the water, you don't have the money. Now, because of this, a lot of the rivers are just not. And then we have the rivers that are also in the Accra, the Densu. The Densu River, mining has also started in the Densu River. That is the one that we have at Weja. In the head, it had already started. In top uh, Potrasi area and all the place, they have started the mining over that. The one, the, uh, the, the tributary that passed through Kofodia area has also been mined. So this is very serious. Now what also happened is that because of this turbidity that happened, it increases siltation of the river. So because of the carrying capacity of the river reduced significantly. So how much water can be carried out is gone. So that when it dries, when it, the season is dry, have the dry season, uh, rivers that you're expecting to be perennial, because of the high level of siltation, you realize that the water available is not, water is, is dry. And climate change and other things affect all this. In fact, if you go to some of our, our uh, uh, forest places where you expect that around this time to be raining, for about two, three, two months, there's no rain. So the magnitude of what we are doing is very, very serious. Uh, I talk about the gold level, the, the mercury, arsenic, and all those chemicals within the rivers. In fact, when you look at the water, there are places you can still find the uh, mercury in it, and some you not know, unless you go to the sediment. So when we go to the sediment, we are able to find them. Uh, there's a longitudinal study that we did that showed gradual increase from about 2012 not at 2207, you find gradual increase in levels of these heavy metal in various water bodies. And I think these are things that we need to take note of it and make sure that we put the best that we can as a people, because our life is really at risk. Because if we don't take time, now what happens is I see the rivers, they interface with the groundwater. The rivers interface with groundwater. And that's when, the boreholes and the rest yeah, that yeah, we yeah, have yeah. in our because homes. Because what is happening is that there's what we call water cycle, where you have a continuous process, where you have a river, the rivers permeating to the rocks, to the aquifer, and then aquifer, when it's necessary, also feed the river. Now, so if your river is full of turbid and other chemical pollution, it will sink down. And then also when the rivers are low in level, it also come up. Now what is happening is that if we finish, we continue this way, the next access you say that the groundwater, but the groundwater is already polluted in those areas. So you look at our village, Accra, we don't feel that much. When you look at our villages, you realize that the river that they need is not there. The groundwater they will try to assess, the groundwater is also polluted. So what did they do? So that is why there are just some few options, but those options I don't think is the best. The best option is that we need to fight Kalamse and make sure that it comes to an end. And you have Whether to... our politicians will help us or they will not help us, they have the power to do the best. But if they will not, we as a people must rise up and look at what intervention, what we need to do to make sure that this galamsey come to an end. Otherwise, we may not find good water to drink. And don't forget, water is life. And we're going to talk about the solutions just very briefly, but just indulge me. You just talked about the water bodies. Tell us about the, the mining on our lands. 
19,000, uh, I mean, hectares of our cocoa farms already destroyed. We heard Executive Director of Nature Development Foundation talking about 37% of our forest reserves also uh, affected. Just tell us how it is affecting even the food we eat. Because we are planting cassava, plantain, and all of those things. Just very briefly, and then we'll go to the uh, policies that are in place now and the solutions moving forward. In fact, the food that we eat, some, some of them, in fact, if it's the mining area and the food that we do, because the other heavy metals are able to go through, because once you plant it in an area where mining has occurred and illegal mining especially has occurred, there's a level of exposure because they pour all the chemicals that are being, uh, which they use for the uh, extraction of the gold, they pour it over there, and that is what uh, happened. And that is why there's the need for bio remediation, which we have this expertise and stuff to do. But it's also talk about money. So sometimes when you look at the economic benefit of gold and its negative impact, you would then need to make sure that the illegal mining is stopped because its negative impact Go to the places, the people that are going to school, they've stopped going to school because they will get more money going for gold than going to school. That is what their mind tells them. So a lot of the people are not going to school. A lot of our children are being impregnated in the places because the people have that money. They think they have so much money. And you know, Ghana, we come to the point that a little money, people will bow for you. So the little gold money they get there, they use it to mess up the entire village and that is why i say again please let's do what we have to do because if we don't do that the generation after us will curse us that we took no action and that is what is happening to that but the good thing is that if we allow if we can put a ban the water will regenerate when there was imposition of the ban we look, we did research to look at before, during, and after. And there was significant difference in terms of the quality, in terms of the color, the turbidity of the water during the imposition of the ban. The water will just regenerate itself. So I will recycle itself. So please, there is the solution. Some of the solutions are there. But we need our politicians to help us. And we thank uh, MP for some of the things that you're doing. I believe that we need more of you in our time to help Ghana save its people from a looming disaster that lies ahead of us because of the destruction to our rivers, to our land, to our forests, and to our people. Thank you very much, Prof. A round of applause for Prof, please. And uh, this is our continuous discussion on the fight against illegal mining beyond the talk, what is next? Let me tell you that if you're watching us live on TV3, there will be no news central today. We are continuing with this conversation to try and find some answers uh, to the many questions that have been asked and really what is being done and how differently we are going to do uh, what needs to be done to ensure that we bring an end to this uh, very problem. And I'm coming to you, uh, Brigadier General Nunu after. So that I'll come to Yawula and then MP for Achim, uh, Asante, Achim. Asante Achim North. North. Yes. <laughs> Asante Achim North. Brigadier General Nunu Mensa, uh, we were earlier talking about the operations that we've had. I mean, when the government thought of, um, when President Akufado put his presidency on the line, we had Operation Vanguard and then Operation Halt 1 and 2. You are a military man. Based on your own observation, briefly, how do you think they failed? And moving forward with the kind of policies, I'm just asking you two questions in one. With the policies that we have now, is there a future, really, that we're going to be able to deal with this once and for all? As a military, sorry, as a military man... Please look through the cameras for us. <laughs> I wouldn't use that way to solve the problem. You have to understand the problem. It's a socio-economic problem. You don't ask so yes to bull down 
uh, whatever it is, with people who are hungry. I achieve our defense staff, then wouldn't have the military for this purpose. What I would do, find the land. These are people, see, you have to give them alternative. Even what we are doing, you cannot put them to go anywhere if they are hungry. They are families, they are human beings. I will look for a line of few land somewhere, a front plains so the north, where soldiers are there. Paint everybody wants to so join the army because that's the only work available in Ghana today. They are not being used for any purpose. They are paid. Need a few, a few materials to build them like kibbutz in Israel. Settle them. Give, them. give them a place to live. And then, if you appeal to them, those who want to work will be moved to go and work. But you can't just go and sack them to go away. Live away. Feed their families. So I wouldn't have used that. I, mean, I wouldn't have If I was, I was with the president of I knew him very well. I would have advised him, no, don't go that way. That will not solve the problem. Get them a place to go and live. It can be done. I built O'Reilly Senior High School in 50 days. Move O'Reilly. O'Reilly was being run down. It can be done. I didn't sleep. I'm a military man. So if that is done, you, you can gradually thin out these people from where they are polluting our water bodies and whatnot. It will be easier then. But just go and go. So just come and ransack them to go away. They won't go. That's not the way I would have solved it. That's not the way you would have solved it. Now look at where we are going. Right now, with this increased calls for us to end illegal mining, the government has set up a five-member committee. Defense ministry is part. We have information ministry, uh, as well as other ministries, five of them. Do you think this approach will work? No. What they should do is go to the army, get some young military general or somebody, a soldier, who is, who is, who is, who is not. There are 2,000 soldiers. I mean, you can either have the thinkers and, and the... I mean, I don't want that. I'm not that type of soldier. So get them to come up with a plan. Go around Ghana, at front plane, get some land somewhere. Look, we are short of food now. Ghana can't easily, food become very expensive. And there's no food anyway. So rather than throwing them out to somewhere, it would be easier to get them to move to, so they can build them accommodation within two or three months and move them, settle them, give them machines to work and produce cassava, produce um, whatever it is for us, rather than just, uh, no, I would not go, I would not advise them to go this way. You wouldn't advise them to go this way. I'm coming to you, Awola. First of all, are there clean rivers in Ghana, really, based on your own research? Well, I mean, the Volta has not been, as has just been said, has not been as badly polluted as the others. But I would like to say that if our forefathers had been as wicked and irresponsible as we are being, we wouldn't have any forest reserves or water bodies. We'd have to go to museums to say that, oh, this is what a forest reserve in Ghana used to look like. And I think we should hang our heads in shame. But I would say that coming to the solutions, because, you know, the president put his presidency on the line seven years ago. Part of the challenge is that the firefighters themselves are the arsonists. So how do you put out a fire when you are the one setting? I mean, let's be absolutely frank. Because we, are, we face a clear and present danger. I keep on saying we face an existential threat. We shall all perish if we keep on having meetings upon meetings upon meetings. The time for meetings is over. When the house is burning, you put out the fire. We don't now get data on how many fires there have been. We put out the fire first, then we can do other things. So I believe that what has been said by... Um, I mean, my, my head is so cold. <laughs> what has been said so far must be done. We have to drive, we have to declare a state of emergency to give ourselves the necessary um, cloak we need to go and remove everybody from our forest reserves, not negotiable, every single person from our forest reserves and for our, our, from our water bodies. Then LI 2462 obviously has to go away. It's a perverse piece of legislation. But uh, well, before you even go to the LI, you understand that the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Sami Abu Jinnapur, says there's no need to call for any state of emergency. You see, he can say what he likes. We have, we, the, the facts speak for themselves. For seven years, for seven years, we put out, why did we put our presidency on the line? Because we saw how bad the situation was. Seven years later, it's gone from bad to worse. The house is burning. We are being poisoned. Is this the time to be having meetings upon meetings, discussions upon discussions? I don't think there's any single sane person in Ghana who is unaware of the problem we face. 
We can behave like ostriches and pretend we are not understanding what is going on. The medical, um, the doctors have spoken. We know about their kidney disease. I have a very good friend on, with, on dialysis. You don't want to be in that situation. Even if you had millions of CDs, you don't want to be in that situation. So why are we doing what we are doing? Now, what we are doing is a war crime. You know that doing war, when you poison the source of water, it's a war crime. In peacetime, we are poisoning the source of water. And I'll say it again. We could master the police to go and arrest unarmed uh, demonstrators. But we're allowing people to poison our water bodies while we just look on. So I would say, let's get on with the situation. Go to the forest reserve. Get rid of everybody there, whether they have a license or not. Because nobody has a license to um, poison our, our water bodies. And as has been said, a lot of our rivers take their sources from the forest, whether in Atiwa Forest, the Draw River Forest, whatever. Get everybody out. Um, repeal that perverse piece of legislation. Whilst we are at it, let's also get rid of EI-144, which is taking away the lungs of Accra. Achimota Forest is one of the last remaining forest reserves in Accra. Who in his right sense wants to declassify any portion of it? Mm. And then we need to be sure that we are going to deal with Professor Frimpon Boateng's um, report and uh, go into the allegations that were made. Because Who we should have deal with it? The government footage. has dismissed that report. You also heard the AG saying that uh, there was no evidence to even prosecute the top officials who were You know, named. let's, 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 um, I don't think this is a forum I want to go into certain things, but let's be absolutely clear. Frimpon, uh, Professor Frimpon Boateng is a very respected person. He didn't just get up and write a report. There was a lot of investigation, there's video footage. I mean, he's not just somebody walking down the street. He has written a report. Let's give it the respect it deserves. If it's mentioning people we are close to, so be it. The important thing is that we want to save Ghana. Our children will not forgive us. Our children will not forgive us. We are all complicit. As has been said, if we took a united stand, what is happening wouldn't be happening. But there's a hole in the hedge. Whether it's the chiefs, whether it's um, the, the security forces, there's complicity. This scale of illegal mining would not go on if there wasn't complicity. Let me be absolutely clear. There's nothing wrong with our laws. It's enforcement. In Atronsu, for instance, when... Um, as I said, the regional minister was uh, brought. He did nothing. I found out from the EPA that even when you have a license, that doesn't mean you can go around um, in, in <laughs> indulging in mining. That's a limit. You need, a, no, first of all, you need um, um, a permit from the EPA. You also need a digging permit. People just brandish licenses and then they go around digging water bodies. And the monitoring agencies stand idly by. And that is why we said stop all small scale mine because even with the big ones we can't monitor we're allergic to enforcement whether it's noise pollution whatever laws they are we're allergic to enforcement so how can, when you can't even enforce when it's a few big ones how can you enforce when there are thousands of um, small scale miners you can't do it so let's stop it all let's stop issuing licenses and then maybe sanity will begin to prevail i heard you talk about uh the fact that we're behaving like ostriches you uh, ostriches you think that what is happening now is a manifestation of indirect, quote-unquote, dishonesty on the part of those supposed to deal well, with it? Well, as I keep on saying, the facts speak for themselves. If you live in Ghana, you cannot tell me that the media have done a brilliant job. You cannot tell me that you don't know what is going on. So if you pretend that it's just meetings upon meetings that's going to solve the problem, you're either deceiving yourself or this is pure wickedness because people are being poisoned as we speak. Even us in Accra, are we 100% sure I went to the launch of uh, Is It Poison for Gold? And the Minerals Commission um, chief executive said when he was a child, he drank uh, tap water. But he would not allow his children today to drink tap water because he cannot trust Ghana water about the state of the world. This is telling. You will not allow your children to drink tap water. What about the children of other people who can't afford um, the mineral water? Even the mineral water, do we actually know what we are drinking? Mm. So what is going on is pure criminality. And some of us want to pretend that uh, we are having discussions to solve the problem. We know what the problem is. We know what the solutions are. Let's get on with it. Uh, thank you very much, Awola. I will come to you, Daryl, but I want to get a thought of uh, Andy Apiakubi. I know you haven't commented on uh, the description of the arrest of unarmed civilians who are protesting against this fight, and also whether or not you think this new approach from the government, setting up a five-member committee, we understand at this stage they are meeting stakeholders, consultative of a, of a sort. You are also in parliament. Really, your thoughts on, on what's going on now. My sister, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, uh, let us 
uh, try and take politics out of discussions on this calamity because it is a national issue. Uh, because uh, Galamse started in Ghana in 1989 when the small scale uh, mining law was passed, PNDC law 218. And the law on uh, Mercury, two and PNDC law 217, was passed also in 1989. And then uh, in 2006, there was the Mining and Minerals Law uh, uh, Act 713, which was also passed and consolidated all the mining laws into an act of parliament. Uh, uh, Pursuant to 2006, we have seen governments who have allowed uh, the, uh, mining, small scale, and whatever to, to prevail in Ghana. So all of us, we are all part of the creation of the problem. So let's take politics out of it. Uh, sometimes I've seen my brother, uh, Abu Jinapur, come from a mining site so devastated. Uh, he would do something if he can have the power to do what all of us can do. So let's not just leave the trouble to him alone. He cannot solve it. Uh, now come back to uh, the demonstration and the consequences thereof. Uh, well, everybody has a right under the law to exercise uh, that right to demonstrate. But every right is also associated with some responsibility. The fact of you demonstrating against uh, some happening that you disagree with doesn't also give you the right to come and vandalize my property. If I'm selling along the street and you come throwing stones at my my doors and my glasses and I mean, is it part of your demonstration? Obviously not. But that's, so, that's not exactly no, no, what happened. I'm coming. So let us also demonstrate responsibly so that the law will also protect us to do our demonstration to the health. And I saw some demonstration in Kumasi when the Electoral Commission's office was being vandalized. I think that it is wrong. I would have joined the demonstration of yesterday if it was tailored to meet the expectations of civil society in respect of uh, Galamse without the politics, because I won't support anybody in politics in this. We so have all failed. Uh, but uh, I haven't seen the charge sheet. I'm a lawyer, so I have to speak to the law. Yes, I haven't seen the charge sheet, and therefore I cannot speak specifically to why they were remanded. But granted that they have been put uh, in custody, and the lawyers don't lift up your, heart, your hand in despair. There is a process. You need to go on appeal on that. And indeed, I did the case of Republic versus Amina Muhammad. It was a public interest case. And any time I went to court to uh, apply for a bail and move the motion on bail, I had an appeal in my pocket. In the event that that appeal did not succeed, that motion did not succeed, I will proceed to the Court of Appeal or to a high court in the case that we were doing at the circuit court, to the high court immediately to file my uh, application and rely on the case of uh, uh, um, Martin Edmidu versus the Attorney General. And he says that all cases or offenses are bailable. So rely on that uh, locus classicus and make your appeal forcefully so that you press for uh, the, uh, the bail application to succeed. So it is not uh, foregone that they will stay in custody. Please, let's exploit the law. And in some of these cases... This is uh, your microphone for us. Some of these cases, uh, you can... And indeed, in the case of the application to annul uh, the LI, uh, those in court, you can get me uh, on your side. I'll be there to do the advocacy for you because I have applied to the Supreme Court to cancel some laws that are uh, inconsistent with the Constitution. So I, I have this, the fly to do that one. So if anybody consults me, I will work without one problem. No. So, because this is a public interest case. But I'm saying that if you have a good case, but you are doing the case in a wrong law, a law court, you will not get what you need. So let's do it right so that we can get uh, the dividend of our, our labor. And uh, now going to the, the scientists have told us the consequences of our actions and inactions in the fight against Galamsey. 
And I say this, that uh, we have given you a blueprint. If you want to adopt it, fine. And I'm saying that all of us must put our efforts to fight this canker because it is there to destroy all of us. And then people are coming with all kinds of justifications, albeit economic. You know, economic justification cannot uh, give us an override over criminality. So if you are doing something that is criminal, otherwise we will say that uh, let's leave the murderers to go and murder so that they take people's mm. money. And that is making money. No, law is law. Crime is crime. Crime is of no color. And if we find that this is criminal, no matter the benefits that will accrue to a beneficiary, it is still criminal and let us prevent it and prosecute people who attempt to do that. Let so prosecute even, people. I think that's an interesting bit because now the conversation is about catching the big fishes. Okay, now, and leaving... now let me come to... Uh, uh, Brigadier gave us uh, a solution also. Let us not forget. Uh, you see, when the moment you put a military clothing on somebody, you change his attitude, you change his thought processes, and you change his uh, responses to disciplinary codes. So if it is... Uh, the clothing of people who will get them to the farms to do the work for all of us, put the clothing on them and let them respond to the disciplinary procedure and let them be pro uh, productive in the economy. So it's a good suggestion. I think that uh, leaders must uh, think about that. Let's get more of those idle hands who are rather using those hands in Galamsey into the military so that the military culture will direct them into productive areas and all of us will benefit. I'm wondering what I was uh, thinking about this, but let me come to you on really uh, whether or not you think this new approach, five-member committee, is wh what we need and uh, some of the recommendations from Andy and, of course, Major General Begedia yes, um, Nunemesa. Okay, thank you very much. Before I go on to that question directly, let me differ from the Honourable's point that Galamsey is not about politics. I think this is a political issue. The politicians have made it a political issue. I mean, you hear organized labor talking about a cessation of mining in our forest reserves and rivers. And at the same time, a week after that, or two weeks after that, they are launching miners for Baumia. If you go down, I mean, the fourth essay did an investigation and, and tried to find out who are those who are getting all the concessions to mine our forest reserves? And all of them are coming from people within the current government. That is problematic. It's already politicized. Go right now to the ground and check who has concessions to do community mining. Who are those who own those mines? They belong to people within the current government. So it's already been politicized right from the word go. And for as long as it involves the allocation of resources, to people either close to us or even familiar with us is a political issue. And whether we like it or not, we need to admit that that is what it has come to. So to that extent, I think we need to also take it because if you look at all the actions that are also being preferred, it's also being preferred to speak to somebody's term of office, whether it's going to allow them to win. I mean, I was very sad to hear that the last time we tried to act against Galamse, we lost votes in certain areas. That is not leadership. That is looking at um, garnering vote because they really want to serve the people, but rather they want the vote because they want to look at their own interests as a political entity. So to that extent, I think that is a political matter and needs to be discussed as such. Now, let's look at the points of the action of whether we need an ad hoc committee. I agree with Awula Sewa when she says that we've done too much talking. I mean, where has the ministry been? I mean, what have they been doing all these years? After the work of Operation Halt, Operation Vanguard, what have they been doing? Are they telling us that they've just been sitting in the office, not doing a regular evaluation of what is happening, and so therefore already proposing what needs to be done? It takes the outcry before they say, let's set up an ad hoc committee. I mean, for me, I don't see the need for that. And that is why I think I agree with Media Coalition when we say, we are not meeting with you, until you meet our demands. And it also came out rightly that when the organized labor met with the, the committee, they decided that, look, the committee was not offering anything new. So you go and listen to our demands and come back. Let's see you commit to meeting our demands, and then we'll talk. So for me, I think that we are at a point where we need to see the leadership take action. Let me add, I, I have to say that um, Honorable 
uh, made a very good point, and I totally agree with him. The thing about leadership, if certain people are not complicit, there's no way Galamse will happen. That is a fact. If you go to some of the communities, you see the police, mining is happening right behind them. The case that um, Professor mentioned, Potrasi, the community is so agitated. They want to stop mining in Densu River. The police in the district is not ready to support them. They are fighting head and nail. They are going to the regional office. They are talking about it. They are asking for the police to act to stop a notorious miner known as Ronim, who is working at Potuase, destroying the rivers there, and nobody is paying attention. So for me, I think that the point about leadership, yes, citizens have some power, but this fight, if the leaders don't take it up, if they don't own up to it, we are just wasting our time. And that is why I am very happy that we are taking the fight to the presidency. He has control of all the machinery, the police, everything at the disposal. I don't understand why there's a decentralized system, district assemblies, dissect, resect, and all of these impunities are going on. So you really look, see that there's really a leadership deficit when it comes to addressing the Galamse matter. And so for me, an ad hoc committee now is not going to serve the purpose. I think we need to take the actions, and then we can say, let's talk. An ad hoc committee is not the solution. So I'm just wondering what you think as our audience listening, really, to all these comments coming in. Reward for what you have done to see that. Okay, so we'll do that, and I will come back, to, we'll actually come back to the panel. But please, if anybody has question, okay, so uh, can we please give them the microphone just very briefly? We'll be wrapping up very shortly. We'll come back to you for your final words. Uh, really, and moving forward, one this. Okay. Please, if you would just help us out. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let's go to Mr. Kariwe, right? And after that, we'll come to you, sir. Comment or question? <laughs> Thank you. I'm very excited that uh, this program has been put together. Beyond the talk, what next? That's what we should be looking at. So when I hear people still talking about the past, then they are not looking at what is next. What is next is not the past. What is next is the future. So we should all talk about the, the future. But then I want to ask the Honorable uh, MP, I've been admiring you so much. But there are many things I also disagree with you when I, you appear on TV. Very legitimate. You said that uh, within the community, you have four people mainly. MP, M MMDCs, chiefs, and then opinion leaders. If one of them does not agree, or the, if they don't agree, then of course the manner will happen. The question I'm asking is, when an MMDC decides to allow mining to take place, what should happen to him? If an opinion leader decides to allow mining to take place, or does not agree with the others and allow mining to take place, what should happen to him? Please, I am very much sometimes frustrated when a problem comes, we want to say that it is all of us. How dare anybody anywhere come to accuse me standing here that I am part of the people who are doing mining, when I'm not doing mining. It is wrong. We are in this studio. We know who handles what. If there's a problem, deal with that person. So it is not everybody here that also has the solution. So the solution rests with our political leaders. The president has been vested with the authority, but they're abusing it. When he was appointing uh, uh, Professor uh, and all those others, he will give their background, their CVs, renowned days, eminent, and so on. What was the need for that? When those people later on come and give their opinion, you reject it. So today, the problem will continue to hold the political leaders responsible. They are uh, reckless. They are not thinking about us. They are not thinking about the future. So we must hold them accountable. And that is why we are asking 
Who, is, who can hold a state of emergency? It is only the president. And none of us here dare not move to the Galamse side and say we want to stop them. It is the president. And it is his authority. So this is where I am coming from. And I think that I want you to ask, answer this question. Because that <laughs> if the MMDC does not or continues to do Galamse, what should happen to them? And those your other communities, and the example you have given, and you want us to use that as a model, I say no because it is just a community. That a national solution cannot be what you are prescribing in your community. Thank you. Please, you can, you, okay. Okay, so let's take about three questions. Okay, so please, let's have your answer uh, very briefly, and then we'll come to Dr. Jamal Tan. Doc, I very much agree with you sharing your frustration, but what I'm saying is that uh, any one of them, if he is complacent with the, the activities of ligament, it will happen. Without them, it cannot happen. So I'm taking part of the blame. But like you're saying, if one of them misbehaves along the line, it is the whole company will deal with him. I will tell you the case of uh, the cattle railing in Agogo, and you heard it, a lot of trouble with us in Agogo, when we rose up as a community to fight them. Uh, you see, there was one police officer who was in charge and who was supporting that activity. He got to acknowledge that night we didn't allow him to sleep there. That night, we had to remove them from him from here, although he was the police commander. We will not entertain him. If the will is there for us to act, and in fact, I, I'm talking about individual communities because in my community, the next community there is Galamse. I cannot go there to do what I'm doing in my community. So I'm trying to encourage everybody in all the communities because the government is in Accra. Uh, the minister, I have seen him visit a site and come back devastated and appears, you know, helpless. But I told him that encourage the community to fight themselves. In fact, the minister told me that he has never given any certificate uh, under his hand to anybody to go into our river bodies. No. But the, even the people you give certificate to for the right, the right places, they will still use the same certificate and go to the river bodies. So crime is crime. Let's see them as criminals so that we deal with them. Uh, I talk about non-political nature of this because it has happened in every regime. And it will happen in other regimes to come if we don't treat it now. So the call, the clarion call, is for all of us to help treat it. And you think that you cannot affect uh, the case in Agogo. I didn't see it. It is the chief who called me, and he called me and told me that, go to this place. I have heard that people are doing this. In, in Domiabra, Nana Bafo, he called me. Oh, no, but me. if you can wrap up in like two se so, uh, 20 seconds. All that us. I'm saying is that what you know, you can mobilize the youth. In fact, if I go to my community now, mobilize the youth, go and sack this guy. We will do it. So the, the people we have looked up to to perform, they have not performed. Is it the case that we will throw our hands in despair? No, let's do something, all of us. But again, yesterday's demonstration. I'm Please, saying, I will have to, I will have to uh, catch you here because I need to take uh, some three more questions before we wrap up. We are about running, uh, uh, wrapping up. Dr. Jamal. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Honorable and commend him for volunteering to you know, join the public interest matter that is in court. And I also want to commend him Sorry for his to leadership. Sorry you. Please, let our questions be very his, brief. Yes. And let me remind you that we're also live on 3FM 90. Right, for his leadership in his area. But uh, yes, but um, I want to hold him by his own principle. <laughs> he's refusing to comment on the criminal charges because he's not seen the charge sheet. But it's convenient for him to say he only heard in this room that the action is before the high court and he can declare very strong, with strong opinions that that action will not see the light of day because it's in the wrong forum. What is the cause of action? You don't even know this. So by your own principle, we'll hold you to that. I mean, you've not read it. Honestly, you've not seen the rate. When you see the rate, then you can engage it at that level. So don't um, prejudice the minds of um, the public. Second thing is, you know, you speak as a politician, and I understand you. It's perfectly okay. But I want us to look at science policy kind of approaches. It's not what we say to um, 
to the public and what I mean, how we kind of shift goalposts and you know play, play blame game. My issue is if we are going to use if what we frame this problem to be is a problem of policy failure, then we must have sound policies to engage the problem. And so for me, if you are saying what works in your community should be applied everywhere, I would say those ad hoc or those kind of um, situational approaches do not help us. We need an overarching framework. We need one that we would have clear indicators, scientific basis of what the problems are, what we are addressing. Then we can engage uh, the problem properly. And so let us have a, let's use mm, best if practices. You can, if you can just wrap um, up in like 20 seconds for us, please. Evidence should speak to what approach we would use and then let's keep the politics out of it because you are politicking a lot here. All right, please, the, ne the, the, the next person, please. And then after that, I'll take two. You also have a question, sir. Okay, I'll take the two. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Ms. Anyaba wants to... Hello. Okay, please, go on with your comment or uh, Thank question. Thank you very much. Uh, your name, name, please. My name is Thomas Abuga from Upper East Region. I'm a climate change activist. Uh, taking this uh, debate into action, we've been calling for climate justice. In about a few months, uh, Ghanaian youth will be going for uh, COI and conference of parties to also be attending. We are advocating for climate justice. Uh, I want to thank uh, Racho Ghana yesterday for their campaign on World River Waters Day. The campaign was superb, nice campaign for the youth. Uh, my message for Darren here is you are giving the president a momentum of. 30th, why don't we uh, take the international community on? Recently in Upper East, the matter is going beyond the country. Uh, minors were intercepted in Navrongo, going to Sandama to do uh, illegal mining from Burkina Faso, which is an international uh, 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 problem. So I think we should involve the international community here. Racho Ghana, this is for you. Thank Interesting perspective from there. Miners being recruited into illegal mining from Burkina Faso in Ghana. Uh, we are grateful to have uh, Nature and Development Foundation supporting this very conversation we are having live on TV3, live on 3FM 92.7. I'm coming to you, former president of uh, the Peasant Farmers Association, Charles Nyaba. You have a question or contribution, please. You're ready to hear you. Yeah, so the first one is a question for or um, a comment, I think um, we are doing well, but just like you said, I don't think we are biting enough. We are not biting enough. Uh, assuming we had about a million or two million people on the street on this demonstration, do you think the police would have been able to do what they are doing? We've not reached out to many people enough. Farmers are crying day in and out. They've been calling on our various platforms. When are we going to do demonstrations? You can reach out to all of us. So I'm urging you that from here, let's form a platform against Galamsey. Try to reach out to communities, those who are affected. By 30th, if the president doesn't act, we will force him to act. I don't think we have, we have forced him enough. And then, Honorable, um, even though I agree with some of your approaches, but just like my colleague said, I think there is too much politicization in your statements. Yes. I say that because you are fighting this for your communities. What have you done in Parliament? What is your contribution to all what we are saying? We want to hear you in public condemning the president and condemning your colleagues for allowing this act to go on. Because if you are saying we shouldn't politicize it, then we continue. And this time, the same thing will come. So the issue is dire now. So let's all join. Join us. Because if you keep saying this, you continue to politicize it, and we will never end it. Dr. So Chow. to me, I think what we need now is to force our leadership to act. Dr. Charles Nyaba, former president, Peasant Farmers Association, thank you very much. Let me come to the gentleman and the lady there, and I'll take the last question from the man who is on the, my left side. Please, your name and your question or contribution. Okay, my name is Prince Ahenkra, and my question is to the organizers of this program. Why is it that we don't have a representation of these Galamseyers in this discussion? And secondly, the, uh, the phrase 
the fight against Galamsey. Because if you tell me you are fighting me, I also prepare myself to fight back. So I think we should coin another word for that fight. There shouldn't be a fight. It can be maybe a dialogue to maybe to end Galamsey or so I suggest that we coin another word rather than the fight. Okay, so the, your problem is with the fight. Lady, please, your name and your question. Okay, my name is Robina. And then it's obvious that many people, like the gents especially, top school or drop out of school, do galamsey. The gents, you mean young boys? Yes, okay. especially. <laughs> drop out of school to do galamsey because they want money. So if that's the case, they say, okay, there is no job, unemployment. So why can't they use the same lands that they mine to build factories, to create job opportunities for um, the owners of the land and then the unemployed in the society? And then why are they creating health problems in the country, knowing very well that the country, like the health um, system in Ghana, doesn't have solution to most of the problems they are creating. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let me come to you, and you'll be the last person, and then we'll come to the panel to answer some of the questions and perhaps a contribution on the comments that have been made from the audience. Yes, sir, your name and... Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Richard Johnson. Uh, all right. So... Uh, my is a contribution. I want to start this way, that um, the fight against Galamse is a political issue. We have already politicized it already because the president says he puts his presidency on the line and the presidency is political. So if you put your presidency on the line, then it means you are politicizing it already. Okay? And what does it mean when you say you put the presidency on the line? It means that when you fail, you need to resign. So being there up to now is an indictment to that office. Secondly, you said uh, when the minister goes to the ground or the uh, mining areas, he comes back uh, devastated and all that. What, what, what are we expecting him to do? If you say that you, have, you, you sit in your office and you give concession to people to go and mine somewhere else, and you go there, you find out that they are mining the river bodies. What, what are you coming to tell me to do? Okay, what are you coming to tell me to do? Yeah, it's, it's a camouflage. It's, it's a charade. Okay, so... When you go, you give a concession to somebody to mine in Asukwa, and you go and you find out the person mining in Bekwai, and you are back crying to me, to do what we did. That we should all come together and fight it. Are, are we all together signing the concession in your, in, your, in your office? That we should all come together and fight it? I am in the community, and you give concession to somebody to come and uh, you know, mine, and the person comes to the uh, community with uh, excavators and bodos and moving machines. How will I know that you gave the person the uh, consent to sign, I mean, to mine at Bekwai. And you're asking him to come together and fight it. Like, he, no, he doesn't sound to me. Th thank you so much. I want to come to the panel here. I'll get your final words and indeed what you are committing to towards this fight to end in illegal mining in our communities. But I want to start with Andy Apiakubi because a number of the questions, and please, let's be very brief. We have about one minute each because we need to wrap up this conversation. Uh, a number of people address their questions to you. And the gentleman just even mentioned leadership. And we remember that just when this uh, conversation started, we heard Majority Chief with Frank Anodompre about the politicization of it, saying that uh, NDC has uh, polluted more water bodies than ourselves. So just briefly, in one minute, and then I'll come to you, and uh, we'll, we'll just uh, take the rest of the comments from the panel. Thank you. Uh, indeed, the hypocrisy is in the law itself. Uh, Article 286 the one says that parliament will have to approve of all such concessions to people to mine our resources. 268B says, unless parliament shall give by two-thirds majority that responsibility to another party, that is where the responsibility has now gone to Minerals Commission. And the Minerals Commission does everything and gives the license from Mineral Cooks Commission without coming to Parliament. So the law is, there is conflict between uh, law one and law B. So that's the source of the confusion. 
Now, uh, the minister presiding over that Minas uh, Commission is a figurehead there. All the technical class should do everything and bring him the certificate to sign. Indeed, when he signs the certificate and gives to somebody, there is a monitoring group in the same uh, commission who's supposed. Okay. I think there's a problem with your. Uh, okay, it's all right. Please go on. There is. There is. And please, if you can wrap up in about 20 seconds, because I think you've already done one minute. You see, there, there is a monitoring team in the same commission. And everybody there ought to have been empowered to do his job. The state, state security, everybody, everybody is there. But notwithstanding all that, we are not getting the results we need. And I am advocating, and I'm showing a blueprint. And I'm trying to advise that let us also adopt this blueprint from our individual committees and see whether we will get the results that we are getting. Thank you very much. And and if anything at all, if we want a political intervention, let all political leaders come together and make a statement and let's hold them to it. Thank you very much. The president is going, but the people who are coming after him, what will they do? And Let the, them also speak. And the appear could be. Thank you very much. Uh, a member of parliament for Asante Achim North. Let me come to you, Professor Michael Say, Achinabona, uh, Acting Director General, CSIR. Uh, director of Water Research. Uh, director of Water Research. <laughs> okay, please, your final, your final words and what you are committing to in one minute, because okay. we need to wrap up now. So I think, as I said earlier, the will of the people and the will of the government is very important. I think there was something that we're saying that the, the, the commission that have been set, I think that they have the will and the power of the government. So what they need to do, they must do quickly and together with the powers that the government will give to them and the, the will of the people make together and I think that we will make a lot of progress we'll and for us as an institution one of our mandate is to look research and provide the data that can uh, give evidence and also provide solutions so we continue doing the research we continue providing the data and secondly we're also looking at technologies to help resolve the situation but i think it cannot be resolved when the galamse is still ongoing so if it is resolved, and as we put our forces together, then the technologies that we need, the data that we need, we'll provide them so that we'll be able to return back to normalcy. And it is very possible to return our rivers to normalcy. And where we need to treat, we'll provide what it takes to treat to be able to restore so that our people will get the right water needed to drink. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Professor Mike Ose. I'm coming to you. Achenebona, yes. thank you very much. <laughs> I'm coming to you, uh, Brigadier General Nunu Mensa. Your final words and what you are committing to, even from where you sit. I I will go in for not with force right from the beginning. Force will be used only as a last resort, and we should dialogue with these people, get some institution to ease them out of what they are, rather than using force to get them out. Thanks. That's the way you should go. Thank you so much, Brigadier General Nunu Mensa, former National Security Advisor, former Chief of Defense Staff. Uh, I will ask Sewa uh, your final words and what you're committing to. The microphone. Uh, thank you. I would say that. Thank you very much. I would say that what is going on is environmental terrorism. And we are being poisoned. We need to set up and understand what is going on. The time for talking is gone. We'd like to ask everybody studying for political office to subscribe to the state of emergency, driving everybody away from our forest reserve and uh, water bodies, and also sign up to banning uh, community mining, small-scale mining, whatever you want to call it. And as we've been told, that the waters will begin to um, restore themselves, but we do need a ban. And we do need to understand that it's true, it may have started in 1989, but the fact of the matter is that we're unable to monitor. And I do take your point that when there's, there, there's a countdown, 30th September will come, and everybody should be mobilized because we are being poisoned and we need to do something about it. The time for talking is gone. We know the solutions. 
and pretending to be bothered when we come from the Galamsey areas doesn't work for me. You have the power to do something about it, so do it. Don't keep on issuing mining licenses. When people have said they don't want to community mining, why are you forcing it down their throats? When we know the effect of what is going on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Awala Sewa. Uh, coming to you, Darbos. Yes, um, I would just say that um, mobilizing for action is important now. And then, yes, we are all counting down to the end of the month. So we have the Ghana Coalition Against Galamse. We are inviting all bodies, religious, CSOs, join hands. We are working and rallying behind organized labor and media coalition to really engage the government and force the hand of the president to do what is right for Ghana. I think we've waited for too long, and now is the time we need to demand that action. So join hands with us, and let's get this done. It can't be done. If you don't want to see money in our first that you won't issue licenses in the first place. If you don't want to see money in our rivers, you won't issue licenses. So why issue them and then just say that, oh, you are frustrated? So I think that it can be done. Join hands. Let's get this done. Thank you. It can be done. It can be done. Let's join hands and bring an end to this. And that is how we bring an end to this conversation, the fight against illegal mining beyond the talk. What's next? We do hope that we, you've been able to get something as regards really the way forward and how we should fight this. I'd like to also use this opportunity to acknowledge our sponsors, Nature and Development Foundation. Remember that this conversation doesn't end here with this dialogue. It continues. So let's hear your voice. Also want to thank our panel members, uh, Darubosu, Deputy Director, Arocha Ghana. You just heard him speak there and saw him as well. Brigadier General Nuno Mensa, former National Security Advisor, former Chief of Defense Staff, of course, Awola Sewa, coordinator, eco-conscious citizens, uh, Ghana. Thank you also for joining us on the panel. And Diapia Kubi, Member of Parliament for Achim North, uh, Asante Achim North. Asante Achim North. Let me just repeat that. And of course, we've also had with us uh, the director, Water Research Institute with the CSIR. He's currently the acting director general for the commission uh, as well, Professor Mike Ose Achinibona. I hope I got the pronunciation correctly. Thank you so much for joining us. You've been live on TV3 as well as 3FM 92.7. I've been doing this with Alfred Okase, who is joining us just right now as we wrap up this conversation. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Beatrice. And we'll take the, f um, the closing remarks from the Director of Operations of Nature and Development Foundation, Glenn Asumene, please. Let's put our hands together for Glenn. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alfred. Uh, thank you, everyone, for making this possible. Um, I've been listening to all of us. It's, uh, I think it's a, it's a very lively one. I expected this because of... Uh, how important this whole thing is. So I had a first experience. Well, I've seen Galamse. I grew up in Tokwa. So I saw Galamse then, and I see Galamse now. And uh, I, I had my most recent encounter with Galamse not long ago with uh, community mining, what they call community mining. And uh, Prof, I would want to take, take your word on that. You said that, what, many years ago, you'd go to communities, and the, the, the people would actually fetch and drink water then. I know you are talking about what, at least 20, 30 years ago. I was in a community in Western North two weeks ago, and there's this Galamse site. They call it a community mining site. 500 meters away, we got there, and the guys I was working with just took water, and, you know, they, with, their, with their palm. They drank water from the river. And then 500 meters down, this is where the mining is going on, and it's a mess. And then you walk one kilometer down, and it's mud. And we are living mud and clay for about 15 to 20 communities downstream. What is going to happen to them? How they are going to get water? And the interesting thing is that they had, they had sunk a well, a well, saying that, well, they need to uh, water, they need cocoa for their, they need water for their cocoa. So they have sunk a well for them to, to use that, knowing that they were going to destroy the river. Prof, you talked about uh, restoring the rivers. Um, what I saw, what I saw, is actually a complete destruction of the river. So when it is all done, there will be no more river to restore. So this is the situation that we have there. 
Um, I look at LI based on all the comments that you have made, LI 2462, and I think it makes nonsense of many institutions in Ghana. Pardon me for my word, but I mean, EPA, <laughs> EPA with, with this LI, I mean, what is the, the, the use of EPA? What is the use of Forestry Commission? In this era, when uh, institutions are giving billions of dollars for, to, to, to countries to maintain their, their forest and to establish forest, all we are doing is clearing everything. So what I saw in the community, I mean, I've seen mining in forest reserves, and it's amazing. The fact that we go and see this and still sit down on consent. You know, we spend so much effort, so much time before, before a logging permit is given to a timber contractor, you'll be amazed how much effort goes in. A forestry commission will go in and count every single tree beyond a certain diameter and say that based on this, we can give 10, we can give 20. Now, there was, you mentioned Operation Halt in Galamsey, but before that, there was Operation Halt in forest reserves, where cocoa was actually cut down to, because they were destroying forest. Now, if you go into what we are doing as far as Galamsey and our forest is concerned, they clear everything, cut everything down, and then they bury all the timber. And some of this timber is so valuable, you can't just imagine. This is the situation that we have at the moment. As for the economy, I mean, you have a few individuals making so much money whilst everybody suffers. I mean, take the timber industry. Uh, I can cite the example of Samatex, which has existed for so many years. In fact. They provide electricity free of charge for their communities. They provide all sorts of amenities. You know of the football club and all of that. This campaign now comes in, and in a matter of one week, they are clearing virtually everything that Samatex is going to rely on the next 20 or 30 years to maintain this. And yet, we sit down and observe. I mean, if you look at what is happening as far as Galamsey is concerned, it's as if our conscience as a people has just been, I, I don't know how to describe it, now, I think, I mean, if you talk of the plantain, I, I mean, I, I was citing an example of the plantain. You know, on the street, you see plantains coming from wherever. Uh, you can say, yes, I live in Accra, so I, I care less about Galamsey. But if you are eating plantains, perhaps you should have uh, eyes equipped with laser. Laser, so that you know that it's coming from a uh, uh, western region or it's coming from wherever, and uh, Galams, uh, which is a Galamsey site or not. So uh, concluding, I'll say that I think we have a choice as a people. Either we continue like this, or we need to pull the brakes, all of us. We need to pull the brakes and have a rethink and see what we are going to do. And I think that it should not be a matter of a few Ghanaians against the government or against the miners. It should be all of us having a look. In fact, I think that some people have not seen what is happening. In fact, they get reports. But perhaps it's only when you go to the ground and see what is happening, then you know the decision to take. So on that note, I wish to thank TV3 for, for organizing this, for our panelists, for our speakers, and for the audience, everybody, for being part of this. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Thank you. And we do appreciate all of you and, the, and the, also the audience. And to you, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. For those of you who've been watching us, listening to us on 3FM 92.7, on behalf of the leadership, I want to say thank you very much. The conversation continues. In fact, the hashtag we're using is use your voice. Hashtag use your voice. Because look, silence is not an option anymore in dealing with this fight against illegal mining. So please stay with us every step of the way. This is just the beginning of our continuous fight against illegal mining in our own way here at Media General. My name is Alfred Okonsi. Good afternoon. Galamse is an em environmental enemy for the nation. What could be more serious for any people than to have their entire water supply system at risk? So. I think as lawyers, you should find space during this conference to set up a panel to undertake a quick tour of the communities where the scourge is very, most prevalent, to see the extent of the crisis we face and hopefully deliberate on how the law should respond. As I see it, if an individual poisons the water supply of a community, he'll be liable for severe consequences under the law. What does the law do when one pours mercury into the same water supply 
knowing fully well it can kill. Zoom. This issue now requires the collective effort of all sections of society. Zoom. To do nothing is no longer an option. The Bar Association, the Medical Association, and the universities, in particular my university, should get together and carve a new path to deal with this emergency. Yesterday, whilst I was driving from Cape Coast, in fact, going to Cape Coast, I stopped about the River Pra, and it was, uh, I'm afraid I have to tell you that what I saw, the river, uh, it was so embarrassing, and then if as a nation we live for this to happen to us, uh, I don't know, I don't know. We, we have to fight this. Zoom. No matter what, we have to do this. Zoom.